calmed down yet. We haven't. Uh, it was a damp derby day in Dunfermline, but despite a damage, Dubrovsky, Dan's decisive double, did the damage and downed the deadies. So welcome back to the Oh No 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 podcast, and thank you for joining us as we pick apart the Rovers' fourth consecutive win over Dunfermline Athletic. Uh, I am Duncan Cameron, and I'm joined this evening by uh, Robbie Weir, first of all. Delighted to be here. Excellent. Uh, Blair Hopcroft's here too. Uh, how are you, Blair? Oh, mate, can I just say for everyone listening, that was one take. One take. <laughs> you didn't see me do 30 practices before we started. <laughs> uh, Christina Beatty is also here. How are you, Christina? I'm going to steal Blair's usual buzzing. Excellent. Uh, Carol Allison Smith is here too. How are you, Carol? I'm good. I'm still on holiday. The only reason I know it's Thursday is because it's a podcast day, so it must be a good day. Fantastic. And uh, finally, Scott Fleming too. How are you, mate? Yeah, really good, mate. Cheers. Fantastic. So, um, normally at this point, I say, what were your thoughts going into the game? And uh, and we talk about the starting lineup. But I think the lineup was actually, for once, pretty close to, to what a lot of us were expecting. So instead, I'm going to jump us kind of five minutes into the game and ask instead, Scott, what were your thoughts when you first realised that Kev Dubrovsky was clearly in quite a bit of bother going into this one? Aye, well, uh, you couldn't really, well, I, you couldn't really notice it obviously in the warm up because he wears them sort of joggy things in in the warm up, so you can't tell if he's heavily strapped as it was. So, aye, once he started running out, and it wasn't until it might have been about five minutes in, he may, he may, he had to dive down quite early for Joe Chalmers' save, and it almost like he shot had like pulled up a wee bit, and then you went, he's heavily taped there, uh, wrapped there, so. No, I was, and then straight away, I think they got, we got a goal kick quite early on as well, and uh, straight away Dan O'Reilly's over to take it, and you're going, okay, this is going to be a problem, because <laughs> if he can't even take any kicks, then it was uh, already in interesting enough, because they, I think we were very early on, it looked like we were trying to not pass it back to them, and then they pressed us a wee bit higher than I think we thought they were going to. And it ended up we had to get it back to him, and it just <laughs> did not go well at all. So, um, I think the what was it about two thousand Rovers fans that we had there. I think we were all thinking this is going to be interesting for the rest of the game. If they we need to see how he is diving about the place, but I, I was definitely nervous going in to the rest of the game. I know he's a great shot stopper, but you need to be standing on two feet and be able to kick the ball. Although his throws, to be fair, were more accurate than his kicking. Yeah, surprisingly good um, with the the long throws. Actually, it's p possible to see that deployed a bit more often. But it was um, it was the first goal kick that and I had I had clocked it when he went down for that early shot, um, and then to go back to something that we talked about at Tanadice, where he had to get Scott Brown to take one goal kick at that point. And Blair, I remember you and I talking about it, saying that's it's like kids' football stuff. Bring a striker to the edge of the eighteen-yard box, and so like it can only be because it hardly ever happens that Dundee United haven't thought to do it. So I was delighted to see Dunfermline take an entire ninety minutes of just not bothering to to exploit that in the slightest. Um, really, really good to see, uh, and it was, I think the the single most. Um, kind of decisive decision that um, Ian, I'm stuck on these Ds now, that um, Ian Murray had to make going into the game. Normally with its midfields and all this kind of stuff, that's a huge, huge call to select a goalkeeper who, you know, quite clearly injured. There's no way, other way to describe that. And knowing going into the game, it's not like it happened two minutes in, knew beforehand that couldn't kick from feet, wasn't going to be able to, you know, come off his line quickly at any point that's a huge decision and again as it has done for the vast majority of the time I think with the benefit of hindsight you have to say fair play um, he's got the result you know Kevin Dabrowski played really well I that is absolutely not what I was saying you know kind of 10 minutes in um, Robbie I don't know if you were the same you know kind of through that first half were you itching for a for potentially for a substitution at that point? Yeah, it was it was a very strange st 
starter, well, whatever day it was, <laughs> it was um, <laughs> just because we also factor in. Um, I'm not sure if there was any issues with Robbie Thompson, but you've also got Andy McNeil coming back from Edinburgh City, which in itself was a very strange one, given that I don't know if it's a, a change that we've decided to make ourselves or whether Edinburgh couldn't pay his wages, so we've just hauled him back because we all know about their turmoil. So in effect, you've got two goalkeepers on the bench, um, but there was definitely an element where you got to the end of the first half and you're thinking... Are we going to change it? But again, as you say, it's it's a gamble that's paid off. Um, and even when he did get forced into saves, he did really well. Um, and based off the, the post-match interview from Ian Murray, he seems very optimistic that he'll be back to, to full fitness for uh, the Airdrie match. That's it. And, and full credit to, to Kevin as well, because by all accounts, he was you know at the forefront of saying, no, I want to play in this, doesn't want to step it away. And um yeah, he did everything that he um that he had to do. I think the maybe the slight kind of nervousness of <laughs> realizing that your goalkeeper is is very clearly injured. I thought kind of crept maybe out of the stand and onto the park actually in the kind of the opening period. Um probably up until around about the time of the goal. Um Carol, would you Agree with that? Do you think that maybe Dunfermline started the game slightly better, took their overs a little bit longer to settle? Yeah, I thought Dunfermline were a lot stronger, um, but really slow off the mark that we had an injured goalkeeper. I think three blind mice from the nursery rhyme would have noticed we had an injured goalkeeper before most of Dunfermline did. And yeah, they were just, they were on top of us a little bit more than the first 10, 15 minutes, but they didn't take advantage and yeah, up to the goal, it seemed to wake them up. But yeah, definitely the, the up to the goal, they were the stronger team. And I was thinking, oh, this could be a rough afternoon. This could be a rough afternoon. But then it was the goal, it was fine. So I think we actually got a wee bit fortunate with an aspect of the goal. And it was, we get that free kick and it's a really good position. And it's a, a habit that the Rovers are in. And it, it works for us a lot of the time where Vaughn tries to take the free kick really quickly. And I think that was almost, for me, a, a signal of that the Rovers at that point. They were still kind of settling into the game, still not quite thinking things through kind of comfortably. But the referee pulls it back, uh, makes them take it again. And uh, Blair, do you want to, to talk us through kind of what happens next? So the goal, yes. um, I'd be delighted to. So, um, I mean, just taking a minute, Josh Mullen, I, like, he does it so often now but the quality of that ball into the box was unbelievable and then at first I'll be honest for the far end obviously we were the, the completely the other end um, you couldn't see who scored so there was just a, this beautiful ball into the box bit of a stramash and then the ball hits the net and you see the players kind of wheeling away and we're all going Hamilton? Murray? Like who, who got it? So when we when the, the voice came over to Tano, I think it was actually we heard it was Dan O'Reilly, we were like, oh wow. But actually seeing the replay, the first time I saw it, I was like, it's a Mehmet special. Like, well, welcome back, Dennis. Thanks very much. But I must admit, in hindsight, having seen replay now a couple of times, there is a touch just in front of him. And for one angle, it kind of looks like it's the I, I don't know who the attacker was that ran across the front of him. Was it Vaughn? Aye. At one angle, it looks like Vaughn touched it. And from the other angle, it looks like the defender kind of got a touch on it. But either way, it's right in front of the goalie. He gets a touch on it, which obviously moves the direction, takes it away from the goalie's hands, and it kind of hits him and drops. And hats off to Dan O'Reilly. Like, he, I loved his interview as well, his striker's instinct. He's absolutely right, because he sees the ball and he just buries it. Um, but that it makes was, him, doesn't he? What's that? I think he nutmegs Mehmet for the goal. Yes, I think he yeah, did. I think so, yeah. Uh, but it was, just, it was just one of them where, I mean, Mehmet's basically glued to the spot, having the ball bounced off him. Do you know what I mean? To have somebody barreling down on, on top of him. But um, I thought it was a it was a weird kind of opening passage to a derby game, but it reminded me a little bit of the one, the last one at Starch Park, where it kind of felt like they were playing a derby game 
and we were playing a game of football, like it didn't, we didn't have the same kind of bluster about us, which was exactly the same as the last time. I don't know whether that's maybe part of the game plan, like, you know, play the game, not the occasion kind of thing, like settle it down and, and, and play your own kind of way. Um, but for whatever reason, that, I mean, I, I get that ball for Josh Mullen. My God. I think it's it's partly a, a symptom of the way that they are set up and and, and, and the, the way where their strengths are. There's a lot of running in that team and there's not a lot of composure. Um, I mean, I think we picked on him enough the last time, but Joe Chalmers is the guy that you expect to be putting his foot on the ball. You, you, I'd be kicking and running too. Like, and um, the couple of chances they had early on, it is, it's, it's knocking the ball up. Um, Alex Yakubiak kind of flicking it on. Craig Whiten's there to some degree. Like, it's, um, but you're right. That's, and it's, it was when Sean Byrne got involved and he absolutely does, puts his foot on the ball, ghosts away for people that the sort of the pattern then starts to develop where I think we've got a big enough body of evidence now that this Rover side is better than this Dunfermline side in these matchups because what they are good at doing and what we are, oh, sorry, turn that around, what we are good at doing specifically exploits their weaknesses. Yeah. Um, and a large part of that's down to their injuries, um, to be fair. But um, Christina, do you want to give us your thoughts on the uh, on the goal as well, please? Yeah, so I'm very similar to Blair. I had no idea who had scored it. It just looked like a bit of a scrimmage in the box, and then it went in, and we saw the net move, and then it was celebrations. But watching it back, you can see it's a it's a crappy goal, but a brilliant one. And I love Dan O'Reilly's interview. I thought he was he came across really well. I thought initially when the game started, I thought what well, all I was looking for from the Rovers was to be a bit more aggressive and I wanted a bit more fight. So I saw that, so I was content with that. What I thought in the first five minutes was happening was it I thought it was a psychological thing. I thought they had noticed that Dabrowski was injured and they were in the first five minutes they were they were thinking, We've got this because look at them and they had this confidence. And then I changed then to then thinking, right, actually we've we're acting cool, calm and collected and we know we've got this. We scored our goal. And then I thought, half time, he's going to sub Dabrowski and they're going to come back out and they're going to be thinking that they've got the upper hand. And then when I saw that he came back on, I thought this is a psychological thing that Murray's done. Because everybody I was with was like, there's no chance he's coming back out second half. And when he did, everybody was so confused. I thought, I think this is a psychological thing that Murray's done here. Like, I think he's keeping them on to make it so that we've still got this upper hand and nothing's like faced us, we're still cool, calm, collected. Um, and I credit to him because he did some brilliant saves and I was kind of like, every time he hit the floor, I was kind of like, one son, like that must, be, that must hurt. So um, you're mentioning psychology there. Mm -hmm. He absolutely had their fans, played them like a fiddle. It was so funny to see. And then at the end, he goes down, Full time whistle goes. He's got the ball in his hands and he just chucks it right into their fans that had been giving them stick the whole game. It was glorious to see. Um, every single time they were going absolutely mental about time wasting for us uh, with the goal kicks, but we were completely well within our rights to do it. Um, and we just played the occasion. Um, for me, I, I think the, the psychology part of it just kept the whole game leading up from our first goal to their first goal, I felt like then the psychology then it switched back because then we became too content again. And then that, when you see them about to score their second goal, you see it coming right down the middle and you're like, this is again, it's a psychological thing because we've just thought we've got to half time and we've got this. It's a good point about the goalkeeper actually in terms of if he does make that change at half time, if he does bring Robbie Thompson on, that really is an admission that things haven't been going well enough but actually yeah they're, they're sticking with them and it's it's that we've already said that the rovers game plan kind of relies on it being quite calm and and sean Byrne building through the middle and all that kind of stuff and it is a bold step to stick to that when you maybe don't have that kind of 
safety pass back to your goalkeeper that you've always got. But it is, it's a doubling down of that to say, no, no, we're actually good enough that we're going to come, we're going to do this, even if we can't pass to the keeper. And we're still well, what's going to gonna, what's gonna cause more around. of an upset? Taking off Dabrowski, and I imagine taking him off at half time, he wouldn't have gone off quietly. And bringing on Thompson, what's that going to do for the team morale? I imagine having Dabrowski behind you, and even if he's a little like 80%, I imagine that having him behind you, giving you a boost psychologically, is better than maybe having the change. And I think that See, if you took him off, I don't know what that would do to the team dynamic because I imagine I would... that he would not go off quietly. What I would say is that I absolutely love Big Kev to bits, but if you're a defender, surely you want to have a goalkeeper that can, firstly, if you've got the kicks going out, then that's fine. But then also, if you need to turn, you're not looking for the man to your left or right to be able to sort of say, okay, where are you? And get a pass off. You've got that option as well to say, okay, I can play it back to the goalkeeper and I know that he's going to get up the pitch. So I think, I mean, it... Kev's a, a huge inspirational character for us in terms of our squad. Nobody's going to doubt that. And I completely get your point, Carol. But also on the other side of the coin, I would say that there is that element that it might have offered a bit of reassurance. But ultimately, Ian Murray was right. And that's the most important thing. But in this See, I, don't, it's done. I don't know if if we were more nervous than they were. Like, in, in terms of, like, when you think back through this season, going back to Dabrowski and Dabrowski kicking it long, it's not really an option we use all that much. You know, it's not like yeah. it's something that we do on a hugely regular basis. Um, so, yeah, not having it probably made everybody feel nervy because you know that that option's not there. But they don't actually use it all that much. And I... So I know we're, we're obviously going to talk about the Dunfermline goal. And we'll go through it in a bit more detail and stuff. But live, I thought, he's no got down to that because he's injured. I thought that was... It was not poor from Kev, but it wasn't up to his usual standards. And that was a big part of why I thought, like, who come at half time? This is it's daft. We're we're setting ourselves up for a failure here. Like we're we're sticking at something we don't need to stick at. Robbie Thompson's a good goalie. But then I started thinking, well, Robbie Thompson's also part of the coaching staff. So it's not like you know Murray's going to be going, oh, I'm not sticking in the young boy that we've got behind the scenes. But Robbie's an experienced goalkeeper and he's part of the coaching staff. So they're talking the whole time. They know what Kev's capable of. And actually, when you see the when I saw the replay of the goal, I felt a wee bit guilty actually about kind of doubting Kev because there's a kind of a crossover in front of him. And as the Dunfermline player kind of jinks to the right, Kev takes a step to his left, which is the same side, obviously, because they're facing each other, takes a step to his left, but he hits the shot across the body. So his whole momentum's going one way, and then he tries to get down and he can't quite get there. Whereas live, it looked like he just couldn't get down. I actually don't know if he was as bad as we thought he was because he dealt with everything. He, he, he coped pretty well as a goalkeeper. He just I mean, at the end of the game especially as well, he did some really, really good saves near the end. So I don't he, think that I don't think that was the case. I think you're right. He came out and punched um, as well, which is not something he's massively renowned for doing for us. I'm not so sure. I'm 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 sticking to the fact that I think he was pretty, really quite limited in that game, and I think the in terms of what he was able Probably. to do, not not in terms of what he could do or his capabilities. Um, I think the thing for me, and it, it kind of goes back to what you were saying, Robbie, that what you really don't want is for anybody to be having to think more than they want to. So it's the kind of thing where if the ball gets knocked over the top and your centre half gets turned. You want him to be able to act on instinct. You want him to be able to think the same way he does every Saturday of the year. Can I go to the goalie or can I put this out? And there was a point in the first half where you could see literally as the ball went over Dan O'Reilly's head, he turned back and he shouts Kev. And then as he looks up, he sees and he realises like, oh shit, I've not got that option today. And he hooks it out for a throw in. So he dealt with it perfectly well. But you could see like where the error could come in. And it's that thing where I say, I think that's the credit is the manager trusting all of his players enough to say, right, this isn't ideal, but you will all deal with it. And it's not just the goalkeeper, it's the defence and it's everyone else as well. And I, say, I thought they, they did that brilliantly. Um, and and Ian, Murray's, Ian Murray's interview, he said, was that not a decision that was made right up last minute when they were in the, guy, they, in the bonnet and they'd, they'd kind of made that decision? It's a thing football people say. I don't actually know what it what it entails. They they he had a fitness test in the morning, 
Like, yeah. I, don't, I, I don't know what the, the metrics are for that. Well, I think as well, it comes back to um, what we've mentioned before about um, Ian Murray's just that wee bit more bolder than other managers mm-hmm. in this league. Um, where probably it would be likely with other managers that they would just say, yeah, you're not fit, you're not playing. Um, whereas he sort of said, you know what, we'll stick with it. Um, and <laughs> to be fair, he kept Big Kev, but there were so many other changes in that team that, um, again, that Ian Murray got right. We changed the formation, we moved to the two natural centre-backs, we went to the two holding midfielders that we've all been speaking about for quite a while. And uh, Josh Mullen came back in, um, and rather than sort of running with the, the same sort of attacking options that we have done in the last few games, he's kept Josh Mullen fit from that Arbroath game where he could have came on, uh, didn't elect not to use him, brought him on in the derby and he's completely ran the game. Yeah. Tell you what, let's, let's keep Josh Mullen on ice for now. I want to talk a bit more in the second half. I thought he really excelled. But mm-hmm. to your point about the the midfield with um, Scott Brown and, and uh, Sean Byrne, together almost almost yes, <laughs> nearly i think must be the first time that they've played together since now albeit since we get beat at airdrie but setting that aside i think it's something we've we've all kind of been keen to see at various points now that we've finally got them together specifically in the period between the first two goals so between the rovers goal and the Dunfermline one equalizer scott would you agree with me. I think that's the most dominant period the Rovers have had in any of the derbies so far. Including that uh, 3 game, all of that. I thought that kind of 25 minutes, I thought the Rovers were absolutely untouchable in that period. Uh, to, I would say, yeah, for, for most of it, I think that just that first half in general in the Cup was just dominance anyway. So I would tend to go with that slightly ahead of that 25-minute period you're on about, but uh, I don't think it's far off it. I mean, we I, there was n- no point when we went 1-0 up, I actually felt really comfortable at that point because I thought they've not really... They, they flashed a few crosses across the box and and whatever, but they hadn't really done anything or a lot of link-up with play, but yet we were getting good sort of one-twos down the line with Mullen and Millen. And then also, I thought that uh, it was Scott Brown's best game for a while in terms of the fact that he's been moved back into the midfield, but he was sliding into challenges. He was making sure he was winning these. He was turning 50-50s into 70-30s in his favour every time. So, um, and Sean Byrne does what Sean Byrne does. Just he, The amount of times that he does it every game, you think players must cotton on that he does this whole he drops the shoulder and he goes the other way and he just lets the ball come where and the, the player just runs past looking silly every time so uh, no nah, they two just calmed everyone down and just we we were dictating the play at that point as you say and I thought yeah they two were, were really good although we'll, we'll go on to speak about the second half obviously but I thought Sean Burn, once he got his book in looked quite nervous for the rest of the game. He was constantly kind of not sure whether he should go to the ball in 50-50 sort of challenges, but also even any time that we were passing the ball, but it didn't look like it was going to get to him. And he thought, oh, somebody might come and nick it away. He's like, I'm going to make sure that I'm not in an, an opportunity for somebody to like just fall over me to potentially get that second yellow. So that's the only thing that I would say about Burn in the game after he got his book in. I think I, was, I, I know what you mean. Sorry, sorry, I was going to say that was really early. 17 minutes. Yeah. Book him. Like, there's, there's a lot of credit to play that role in that game for that long on a book him. I did notice that in the in the second half. Exactly what you're saying, Scott. You could tell one of the kind of foremost thoughts in his mind was, I'm not being sent off the day. And there was a couple of points. But in the first half, is in that, that period that I mentioned, I think someone else made this comparison. So I apologise for stealing it. But, you know, in the... FIFA, there's like a mode where you can just control one player. It was like Sean Byrne was the human controlled player against everybody else just on like beginner mode at times, where he was just like well, me again, just like dancing around people, picking it up, going to picking his pass. I just thought that is he Byrne in particular was 
like imperious in that period in that first half. Actually, they couldn't get near us at all. Obviously, though, they did uh, then get very, very near us, um, putting the ball in the back of the net. One of these goals that kind of really comes out of nothing. And if anything, if you were, if you wanted to be critical, I think the Rovers it was almost a little bit too kind of conv- that their dominance had gotten to the point where so much where Ross Millen found himself kind of slightly to the left of the middle of the park, uh, kind of having a pot shot. And it was really the first, possibly the only time actually, even in the whole game, that both Sean Byrne and Scott Brown were out of position at the same time. And uh, I think you, you've got to give a lot of credit to um, to Ben Summers for, for taking advantage of that. Because he sees the gaps in the middle and he just keeps going when I think others might have, might have looked for a pass. But um, Carol... Do you think that is that's just a, a a very very well taken goal, or do you think there's things we could have done earlier in that move to to really shut that down? I mean, it was a surprise because it was the first bit of play on Fenland that had up towards our end for about a good twenty minutes. But it seems to be the same thing we have every week: is that back four just gives a little bit too much space for someone to take those those shots. The same as against our broth is like, yeah, that was a wonder shot, but he was given the space to do it. And that just seems to be what happened is people just caught a little bit out of position. And any time the team gets a space, they take a shot at us and we're not prepped for it at all. Robbie, do you agree on that point? Yeah, um, I mean, it was a, a well-taken goal and they did really well to, to sort of find the space. Um, you've got to give credit to Summers for sort of taking on the man before taking the actual shot itself, like he sort of jinks away so and is able to get in there. Um, but it did come against the run of play at that point in the game. Um, we'd had a few chances um, and it was towards the end of the, the first half, I felt it was a very, very even game. Both teams were sort of, you could see the defensive shakiness of both sides um, and that was quite apparent towards the sort of like final five, ten minutes of the first half. Yes, I agree with you. Uh, the The period between the equaliser and half time was like both sides, both sides kind of just wanted to get in for the break, but also recognised that that was what the other team wanted, and almost anything could have happened in that period. It was a very odd kind of section of the game. I but, should just um, add as well um, a special thanks to the clown in the home oh, end in section northwest, who at the moment that Dunfermline scored their equaliser. Uh, they've got the momentum, their tails are up, decides to chuck a flare on the pitch. The flare sc- stops. So what do they do? They decide to chuck a second flare on the pitch just to delay that game that wee bit more. Special thank you to you, because that's just brilliant. Thanks for killing your team's momentum. Yeah, that was excellent. I, there I was fully... a lot of delays in that game. I th- was, was it 15 minutes by the end of the first half? Because yeah. of injury and flare? This injury was quite yeah. a while. Yeah. And uh, it's good to... I hope that um, I will say that I hope that Fisher is doing okay because again, it's it's never nice to see a player leave a stretch, uh, a play a pitch on a stretcher. But aye, yeah, it's that's a really nasty one, and it's um, I think he's he's I think he's broken his nose. He's got a separate kind of gash on his face, and he was concussed. But that was his, his second, second concussion? concussion in a really yeah. short period of time, which is genuinely quite concerning. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, fingers crossed. I mean, hopefully. That he gets a decent period of kind of recuperation. They actually just set him out, make sure there's there's no question marks or anything. Because as you say, that's really not. Um, we we'll be not starting tomorrow. Yeah, we we'll be starting on Saturday with one of the face masks on. They're like our moon boots. They love them. That is the first face mask I've seen a football wear that looks more like a sort of nineteen fifties motorcycle helmet. <laughs> like normally, it's it's like a sort of sleek. Batman esque piece of kind of carbon fiber, whereas but that you can't even make Hamilton look like Batman. He looks more like Robin. Do you know what I mean? He's just <laughs> diminutive. Um, what a great term to use for him. Totally. Angry like man. Just like gaffer taped some perspex to him. Like <laughs> they're going to get they're going to get Kane from the WWE on a six month deal. I think. <laughs> oh my God! It's Hamilton. Um, see the the just while we're, we're on that goal, I think it tells you the difference between the two clubs as well. Did you see their social media posting mm-hmm. about the goal? 
So I don't know if it's just the quality of what they've seen this season. I mean, it's a well-taken goal. Don't get me wrong. I'm not taking anything away from them. But they tweeted, what, full stop, a, full stop, goal. Like, what have they been watching all year? If that's what a goal. Yeah. We I can't all go to Tana Dice and watch Dylan Easton. <laughs> that, wouldn't even, that wouldn't even make a highlight reel for us. Mm. I think it's also one of these things where... And, and again, right, full credit to the boy for taking the shot. But also, like, I would take the shot as well if my two forwards were Alex Kubiak and, and, uh, and Craig White. <laughs> I did I did enjoy the Dunfermline plan on Pai and Bovril, who was like, we scored against the team that are top of the league. And I was just like, I'm not being funny, lads. And this is no disrespect <laughs> to anyone in our squad. But last week, we conceded a goal to a substitute goalkeeper that was playing up top as a deputy forward, um, albeit in a very freak goal that we conceded. Um, aye, it's, <laughs> conceding goals has been something that we can obviously talk quite a fair bit about as Rovers fans over the last few weeks, uh, just due to the, the sort of way that things have gone. Um, aye. We'd like to give you one to make it interesting, is basically what we're saying. <laughs> I thought actually that uh, I might sound a bit harsh here. I actually thought that Ewan Murray was quite poor for the goal. I, I actually thought he summed up what Ian Murray wasn't happy about after our Brove game of we're kind of pussy footing around tackles and we're not really fully like at our sort of high aggression sort of mode that he's been wanting, but. He just seemed to let him just drink past him far too easily. And he almost is then reaching to grab him and he can't even reach him at that point. But at the same time, you could then go, where is Scott Brown and where is Sean Bunn? But yeah, they were caught higher up the pitch, unfortunately. But uh, I, and then I was always at the same as you guys. It was kind of like, I'm not sh- it wasn't in the corner of the net. So straight away, I'm going, is that actually Kev's fault in the end? But then... When you look back at the highlights, he's actually a little bit uh, unsighted as he hits the ball. So he, he's probably thinking it probably is going to his right, but when is he pulling the trigger? That's when he doesn't know. So no, it's uh, I actually thought it was kind of more, uh, uh, although it was the two midfielders, I thought it was a wee bit on you and Murray as well. It's a difficult call for the defender in terms of like when do you step out? And I think it's when you realise that your man's Craig Whiten. That's when you step out. And uh, <laughs> it is, he's just, he's, it's just, just a wee bit unfortunate that as, as you and Murray gets to him. Again, but I think Ben Summers did really, really well. Not for the first time against us. Um, and he, as he kind of steps across. And um, I, it's, it's a very good finish. And just the only other thing I wanted to mention from the first half, because it's, I think, the second time it's happened where James McPake's been forced into a change in a game against us, and it's made them better. I'm sure it happened in the first game at East End Park. And the second one, he made a change that made them markedly worse, which was nice. And again, thanks for that, James. But then with this one, so they had to make that change when um, Fisher went off, and they put uh, Ewan Otto, who'd started in the midfield, dropped into the the defence. And I thought they then started to cause us more bother, purely because of how comfortable he is stepping out into the midfield and you could see that on sort of our right hand side that was really where they were when they were getting any yeah. kind of joy that's that's where it was coming from for me Otto looks comfortably their best player from what I've seen like I think that he's just really good on the ball just driving it forward does the basics well um, sounds and... I was going to say it sounds really harsh but actually that substitution almost gave them an extra man because Otto kept doing what he'd been doing already he kept mm-hmm. playing as a midfielder but doubled up as a as a centre half as well. They almost, although they were still playing three at the back, he was so advanced at times that they just had an extra body in the midfield that they hadn't had for the first. I don't even know what was it, twenty five minutes or so. I say it just um, it kind of changed the the dynamic of the game a little bit, and I think I mean again, like I'm I'm loath to give them you know too much kind of credit or sympathy, but they do have you know, a lot of injuries. And actually, an individual player level, there are guys in that team who do kind of come out of that game with a little bit of credit. Chris Hamilton's won them, to be fair. Mm-hmm. You know, we've talked enough this season about Scott Brown having to drop back into the midfield, um, sorry, out of the midfield into the defence. You know, uh, Chris Hamilton's doing the same for them, but he's like four inches shorter. And uh, broken skull. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He's, he's, he's half caved in and he's got a 
carrier bag on his napper. I read today as well, he turned down surgery. He was offered surgery and he said no, because they're too short. And I mean, I'm not being funny. Like that's <laughs> so he, they're, they're too short or he's too short? <laughs> which, which, who's short here? I'll take it. Um, that was not deliberate, but I wish it was. They, like, as a, as a footballer, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Like, <laughs> genuinely, you've got a, a fractured skull. Like, get it seen to it. That's ridiculous. But as a football fan, if you've got a player who's literally willing to play through a broken skull because the team's short, do you know what I mean? It says a lot for, for the, like, the, the way... I mean, he's obviously a Dan Fairman fan anyway, um, which makes beating them even better. But, um, yeah, I mean, fair play to him, like, because he, he, he actually had a decent game, I thought. People, oh, can, we're talk, can, can we just reel this in a wee bit? Sorry. <laughs> can we just reel this in a bit? We're giving them a bit too much praise. I mean, we've just beat them for, what, the fourth derby in a row. Can we actually focus, like, on the team that's winning here? On the job in hand. <laughs> Sorry, Carrie, you were going to say something about carrier bags? What was the carrier... What was the, the attempt at a mosaic at the start? Of the, going right back to the start of the game. Bin liners. But bin liners. It was bin liners, wasn't it? Uh, it looked like right, it. Okay. Uh, Just want to check. And as per the Rafe stats page, which uh, to be honest, don't know who runs it, but they did trot out the classic right after the game. They've had more tifos against the Rovers this season than they have wins. So that was beautiful. So, uh, <laughs> they don't care about us. They celebrated that goal. They were chucking the smoke bombs left, right, and centre, but they do not care about us. We're, we're just a wee team that say, they don't care about. So I know we'll come round to this later on in the show, but I mean, it costs one hundred and fifty pound a year to run this podcast. That was six hundred quid. Six hundred pounds for that. A bunch of bin liners and a big sign that said Dunfermline Athletic on it. Like no, I did. Yeah, raised for it. Six hundred and fifty pound. They fundraised. I thought it was oh, yeah. really, uh, really enjoyable throughout the course of the the first half. Watching them uh, try to throw their bin liners at Ross Millen because it's like um, you know the rest of development where Job tries to throw that envelope into the sea and it just it keeps blowing back at him. Like, Do they understand physics? Do they understand <laughs> well, like gravity, weight, and how that uh, stuff? I taught works? a fair few of them. They definitely don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably on you, mate. Um, <laughs> so right, let's 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 um fast forward a bit, right? So we went through half time. The big question marks over whether we'd see Kevin Dubrovsky again. We absolutely did, and again, fair play to him. Excellent performance, um, especially considering the uh, the circumstances. Going into the the second half, I thought personally it, it kind of first five minutes started a little bit the way the first half ended, quite. KG not a lot of control and then personally I'd say I think the, the goal kind of came out of nowhere but you'll absolutely take it and um, uh, let's see Scott I'll let you talk about it first of all so uh, once again it's um, Josh Mullen and uh, Dan O'Reilly combining yeah no I thought it was a case of there was a few corners that in the game that we just we were on the money almost every time. Whereas the last few games, especially at home, we've almost been hitting it too deep, and there's been nobody running in at the back post. It's almost going out for a throw in at the at the other side. But I thought uh, with Josh Mullen coming back in, he's he's delivery every time, and for both goals, it was right on the money. It was. Although I, I have to say, and we'll probably speak about it, well, Blair will let, later on, Josh Edwards had no clue which way Daniel O'Reilly was running to that ball. He was just moving constantly, and he had at no point did he even have a hand on him. And then eventually he's trying to drag him down because he's just behind him. But it was a, uh, it was in the end, it was just sheer determination. Of, I'm getting this ball, and then it was just diving header, ball corner. But it was a. Uh, I thought it was uh, spot on. It was just a brilliant header, but it was also just the deliveries all day coming in for corners were more like how we've been wanting them for a long time. And Daniel O'Reilly, when we signed him, we knew he was the dangerous in the opposition box and he was good at defending the pieces in our box. So it doesn't surprise me that he's now up to three goals already because he is a threat. Um, if anything, I'm still waiting on you and Murray to actually chip and wiggle because he's also a very big threat in the box. But no, it was just uh, a sheer want to head of the ball, to be honest. 
yeah, I think you're spot on. Uh, James McPeg said as much in his, his post-match. Like, it's a real cliche, and it's one I don't really like. People, I think it's a very easy thing to say, where it's like, oh, they wanted it more than us. But in that specific incident, categorically, that's what's happened. I mean, jo- Josh Edwards is like, I don't know what he's doing. Like, you know, you know, in a restaurant, and like a waiter comes out of the kitchen with like sizzling fajitas, and everybody kind of turns because you hear that noise. That's it's like something has happened behind Josh Edwards, and he's just like he's about to defend the corner, and he's looking at Josh Mullen, and then all of a sudden he's like, "Oh, what's over there?" And it's well, it's Dan O'Reilly, mate, because he's about to head of the ball into your goal, like. I, I don't know. I don't know what's possibly gone through his head there. Um, it's a bright light that's distracting him. It's like in that was it the film with ants, the animation where it's don't fly into the light. Look out! It's too beautiful. It's a bit like that. And reflecting <laughs> off the uh, bin bags in the corner. Exactly. Maybe they heard the uh, the growing thunderous steps of Dario Valenti charging down the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well. I mean, he, he literally doesn't look at the, the ball. No. At any point, and I'm not being funny, if he manages to pull him down, it's a penalty. Like, he, he, it's like he's genuinely given up on winning the ball, and it's like, all right, I just need to stop him now. I just need to stop him at all costs. And he can't even do that. Um, it was brilliant. Uh, such a good header, and such, such again, I mean, we'll, we'll Josh Mullen. <laughs> we just, can we have an, an extra podcast just to talk about how good he is? But the the delivery, and it was the interview afterwards when you heard again um, Dan O'Reilly talking about it, and he's like, "We we talked about that ball into the front post, and I, I said to Josh, you know, if you can get it in there, I quite fancy myself." I'm like, it's like, but that's the thing. It's I feel like for years at corners, we've just hit balls into the box in the hope that there will be somebody there, and it feels now like there's an actual purpose to what we're trying to do, even when we take it short. There's a purpose to. You know, to move the play or to, or to bring players out or bring players around or whatever, or to slow things down. There's a real purpose to what they're trying to do now, which is something we haven't seen for a long time. It's funny because um, um, the guy that sits by me at Starks, uh, one of them, Richard, every single time he comments if it's a short corner, <laughs> like he'll be doing his nothing. Um, and I did see a thing earlier this season, the Notts County boss explaining like why they play short corners and like the statistics behind it. But it's just that if you lose a short corner, it's like a cardinal sin in football. But again, we we mentioned um, just to go back to Mullen, just the the ability that he's got to get that ball into the box. He, uh, he's won the league on multiple occasions, and it really does show in games like that. Like just his ability, um, and just his overall performance, like just the the wing play and um, linking up with Ross Mill, um, and what he was doing overall was just sensational to watch. I think the the big thing with the corners as well is with Dan O'Reilly and you and Murray and Jack Hamilton, you've got legitimate options, yep. which even to go back a season or two seasons. We just didn't have that many. It's, it's even, it's like the big striker makes such a difference. Because when you've maybe got um, one or two of these guys, it's very easy for the opposition just to mark them out. And even if the ball in is decent, you're, you're, the odds are against you. Um, but again, you look at that Dunfermline side and you look at who they had left on the park. And it's like Josh Edwards, <laughs> as we can all see very clearly now, he's not a guy you want marking a centre half. Like, you want a Benedictus in there, and they've just they've not got them. Again, Chris Hamilton's like five foot four or something, and he must have been marking uh, either Ewan Murray or Jack Hamilton. Like, it makes such a huge difference. Um, does anybody want to offer up a guess as to what Dennis Mehmet was claiming for as the ball shot past him for that goal? Because I, I honestly I have not, a defense. not convinced it's crossed the line, and he's no. waving at the linesman. Like, I think he thinks that Dan O'Reilly's fouling Edwards. It's the baffling. The one of the worst single worst pieces of goalkeeping I've seen in a long time. But, but why does he claim for it first rather than be a goalkeeper first? That's what <laughs> That's I don't exactly understand. It. Is the instinct would be to save it and then argue, but he seems to go argue first. Because he does literally put his hands up and it goes past him. Yeah, it's, it's Three year deal, ladies and gentlemen. Three year deal. <laughs> and they were laughing at us when we got big Kevin. Oh my goodness. 
That is, is absolutely, honestly, my favourite thing, the fact that they gave him a, a three-year deal. And they were, um, I've, I've said it before, but they were so adamant in that League One season. Like, they slaughtered them the season they got relegated. League One, he keeps getting clean sheets because they're played against Gubbins teams that are, like, sitting in. And it's, oh, he's amazing, he's amazing, he's brilliant, he's so good. And then now it's, like, back to, nope, get him out that contract, we need someone new in. Uh, could have played Sammy the Tammy in goal last season they still would have got promoted <laughs> um, Christina give us your thoughts please on on I suppose basically the period after the goal, uh, was there at any point you were worried we might concede an, an equaliser for a second time? Yes, so my prediction before the game was 2-1 but after we had scored that second goal I thought there's definitely more in this I still thought we were going to win but I definitely thought there was going to be more goals after that point I didn't think it was going to finish like that I also thought there was a chance near the end that actually Kev was going to ask to be subbed. I started panicking a wee bit about that and I thought, did he do that right at the end? And a lot of people around me where I was sitting as the, as the game progressed were kind of getting a bit more wanting Rovers to be more aggressive again. I felt like near the end we were kind of sitting back again as opposed to trying to score again. And a lot of people around me were a bit annoyed about that but I was thinking no we need to be keeping our defence because this is what happens to us classic we need to make sure that we keep the defence tight so I was actually okay with that and then I I had heart pain my heart was sore I was so stressed and I was my blood pressure and I'm like my heart actually has pain in it right now so it's just no good for you <laughs> but I did definitely think there was more goals in it. And as the, as it progressed and as it got to, closer to the end, I thought it was actually going to then be 2-2. So I was really happy when the full-time also went, to be honest. That's um, that's why they built the hospital so close to that end at East End Park, I think. Um, and then actually, as I went, as I left, someone said to me, you've seen the Rovers win more at East End Park in the time you've been a supporter than I have in 30 years. And I'm like, you know what? I just take for granted this is what happens. It's not. No, yeah, it really must not. be. Apparently there must be not. so many people like that, though. Like so many kids that go along to these games nowadays. Like just youngsters that have got the under twelve season tickets. Like, oh, this is great. We're just scoring these ninetieth minute goals left, right, and centre, and we're going to East End Park and winning games. Why are people bothered about Inverness? We just beat them every other week. Aye, yes. you don't know how lucky you are. Um, Blair, what about you? That kind of later period, were you were you worried? I was actually, I must admit, it's the most nervy I've been. Probably because it's the powers and because if we're going to concede a late goal to anybody, I really don't want it to be them. Um, probably that more so than I thought they were going to score. They were a bit kind of huff and puff, I thought. Um, a few kind of efforts on goal, but they, they seemed to think that because the goalie was injured, that if they just lump loads of balls into the box that that was going to test them. Whereas I kind of felt like if they'd had a few more shots from distance, they might have actually had a bit more joy. Um, but there just seemed to be this cross the ball in, cross the ball in, cross the ball in. And again, we've mentioned it before, but when you're aiming at Craig White and flipping neck, like you, the, to be fair, they'd have been as well with Sammy the Tammy up front. They still wouldn't have scored because Craig White was rotten. He was absolutely awful. I did think, I'm gonna. I'm in danger of really upsetting Robbie here. I did actually think. Yeah. Sorry, I thought he was a bit better actually. <laughs> the best I've seen of him, because there was a couple of times, probably sort of the twenty minutes or so after we scored, where he got the ball down and actually kind of he turned Dan O'Reilly a couple of times and he did actually get a little bit of joy out of it. And I thought, Do you know what? If if they had a decent striker alongside him. He might actually be a bit more effective, but it's like he's got the ball and he looks up and he's got nothing in front of him. So he just has to keep running and running and running and he can't do it. It's not his game. Like it, it, it feels a little bit to me like they are just not using him effectively at all. I don't think he's that effective for, for complete clarity. But when you're trying to get him to do that job, like pointless. I, I, I agree with you completely. I was saying the same thing to, to somebody after the game. Like... I actually, I was quite, I don't know if impressed is, is the right word, yeah. but like, the it's more surprising. I see of him, the more I think he's, he could be decent, but he's so clearly like a second striker. He's almost, um, 
like in a kind of classic sort of 90s striker duo sense, he's your number 10. But yeah. instead of a number nine, he's got a guy who looks and plays like a mannequin out of the British home stores. Like, just n- offers nothing. Like, nothing. absolutely nothing out of that whatsoever. And um, that, I mean, for, for my kind of two cents on that later period, I was, I was kind of the same. It felt like I should be worried because it was a narrow lead and the goalie was hurt and all this kind of stuff. But they looked like if they were going to get a goal, it was going to be through just continual roll of the dice, like just sheer weight of, of number of opportunities. Eventually one might go in rather than they had an actual strategy to um, exploit any particular weakness or anything like that. It was just a case of, I did think we, we sat back maybe a little bit too early, which is so uncharacteristic of, of an Ian Murray side. But, um, to, to move on just a little bit, I want to talk about substitutions as well, um, because there was a couple there that I thought were very, very interesting. And Robbie, I'm going to come to you, because first of all, I know you want to talk about Ross Matthews, which I know we're, we're all absolutely delighted about. And also, for me, and again, I'm going to, going to cop to obviously not being um, anybody who kens anything about <laughs> what they're talking about. When Lewis Vaughn went off, I would have taken off Josh Mullen instead. I'd have left Vaughn on, I'd have taken Mullen off. But I think between that point and the end of the game, Josh Mullen was absolutely outstanding. So, uh, Robbie, give us just a little bit on uh, both Ross Matthews and then just generally again talk about um, Josh Mullen, please. I think um, overall with the substitutions, they were all absolutely correct. But the most important thing, I'm just delighted to see Ross Matthews back on a football pitch because it's been... Again, he had the, the pre-season games, but it's been stop-start for him, to say the least. Um, sort of a few returns and then off for long periods of time. We all know his quality um, and what he offers to the team. He's got that aggression and bite in the middle of the park, but he can also get goals for you as well. Um, and re- really, I think that people, much like the way that Ian said about Aidan Connolly earlier in the season, how he'd been a player of the year for us and nobody had been speaking about him, we've just had Rolf Matthews sitting there ticking over in the background and he could really be a standing replacement, in a sense, if you get him into that role. I feel like he could actually do it. Um, it was just great to see him. He didn't, to be honest, he didn't have much to do. And to go back to sort of the point that we were talking about before, I kind of reached the, the sort of like five minutes to go from the end and I remembered that we were playing against Dunfermline who have been relatively toothless against us so far this season. And it was kind of like seeing the same story over again, like as compared to the first game. They had all the ball at the edge of the box and then they just lump it in and we cleared it. It was like, watch, it was literally, rather than being in sort of the tail end of August, it was just like it was changed to a winter night. Um, but yeah, um, with the substitutes, just again, just great to see Ross Matthews back. Everyone loves the guy. He's just been a great servant for the club and hopefully it can allow for him to get a a bit of time under his belt. I'd said before it's almost like we created a bit of a rod for our own back by not using him up until this point. So if it gives him a wee gateway to get back into this team and to be able to kick on, I'm all here for it. Huge fan. Yeah, definitely. And um, just a little bit I see on, on Josh Mullen and what he did in that kind of late period of the game. From me, please. <laughs> I'm getting spoiled here tonight. Um, <laughs> uh, Josh was just, just a, it was his best game for us by a mile, I think, comfortably. And um, you could really see that when he got going, just the confidence that he had. And he, he deserves all the plaudits that he gets. Um, like I said, he's won this league a couple of times before. And I think that's probably the best performance that we've seen from him in terms of as an outright winger, because he was taking on players like there was the one that got posted onto the socials earlier where he just the ball comes out the box and he just goes toe to toe with uh, Otto and takes him on and then plays the ball across and gets a corner from the back of it. Um, I'm not sure if it was him or Ross Milne had the one that sort of in the first half that 
um, the crossfield ball where everyone thought it was going out. The Dunfermline fans start weighing and then it goes off the corner flag and just stops. And then it's like everyone's in this frantic rush, which you'd love to see. Um, But yeah, just a really good performance. I feel like um, I mentioned elsewhere that Murray had sort of like three big calls to make. Changing whether he was keeping Dubrovsky on the pitch or whether he was changing to Robbie Thompson, changing the formation and playing Josh Mullen and using him completely. And I don't think anyone might have really thought beforehand that the, the third of those was going to be the major factor in the game, but it turned out to be the case. So again, full credit to Ian Murray and uh, again, uh, Josh Mullen and Dan O'Reilly for how they linked up. That's it. And um, Scott, just your thoughts on the, the very end of the game, please. And um, uh, yeah, any, anything you want to, to add on that, please. Yeah, just touching on the the whole Josh Mullen thing. That I think that was the first game that I actually would agree when I see if we see statistics to say that he ran the most, because that game he was everywhere. Like no matter if we had the ball or we didn't have the ball, he he was just running wherever he needed to be and more every time. So if it comes out that he's ran the most, doesn't surprise me this time. But. Uh, no, I, and I mean, we've talked about it uh, sort of every week that he plays as well. His delivery is the best in the league, I think. it's There was a reason why there was other teams after him in the summer. Not just because he's general play, but just his set-piece delivery. And a lot of the time, if that can be your, just your edge in games, that you can have that one corner or that one set-piece free kick that works, that could win your game. And in the end of the day, that won us the game. But uh, no, I, I, he's been a brilliant signing, and, and a lot of folks say he goes missing in games, and he, I suppose he does. But I just think that you're going to take that when you know what he's going to bring when it comes to that sort of couple of deliveries you'll get a quality. And if if you're going to score goals, that you've got to have him playing. But he he proved that he just he, he had some engine on him, and uh Early in the week against them, Fairman, so fair to play. But I thought, just in general, I actually wasn't as nervous as folk because I was like, well, I would have been nervous if they were hitting shots for 30 yards because that's what I thought was going to be Big Kev's downfall with this injury is constantly diving to the corners and landing on his knee or landing on his hip or whatever. But I don't know if McPake just didn't told them to keep putting balls in the box or to try and walk the ball into the net, but it just, they were, apart from the one shot that they scored from, I don't remember them taking too many shots on outside the box, which is what I thought they needed to do, but um, they they insisted on this whole just bombarding us with crosses. Uh, although, in the highlights, I noticed that Jakubiak actually hit the bar. I actually thought he had just completely mishit it and it went out to the throwing. But, uh, no, I just think I was probably the least nervous when it comes to the end of a derby game that I've been for a while when it's one goal. Uh, no, and uh, celebrations at full time again. Honestly, Ross Millen has to be the. He just loves a celebration. <laughs> Honestly, the guy has just been brilliant this season, although he needs to uh, rein it in when we're actually playing the game because <laughs> he's got far too many bookings this season for it. I love it. The, see the the bit there on the the inside the match day where he's he's running, kind of not running, kind of walking and jogging towards the the fans, and he's obviously thinking like I'm I'm going to get close and I'm going to give it the ass, but he is ending himself the entire way as he's running down. He is outright ending himself up, and it is glorious because like you've got to remember as a fullback as well, he's right alongside those idiots in that corner as well. Do you know what I mean he'll be getting absolute pelter for them? So oh, it must be so much sweeter, like when you actually win a game like that. There's um, a couple of them at full time that you can see when you watch the the highlights. Just turn straight away to that <laughs> corner, the wee feral corner, as yeah. we call them, and uh, just make sure that they know their place. That's it, and it's. Um, I think to your point, Scott. I think to be fair, this team have kind of earned that confidence. That, that everybody has in them. I mean, literally every single game they've won this season, they've had to see out a single goal lead throughout the added time. So, yeah, I think definitely 
a season or two ago, if you were only a goal up, going into six, I think, minutes of added time at East End, at East End Park, everybody would be kind of chewing their fingernails down the bone. But yeah, relatively... Fairness, there's a, there's a, a good number of those games where they've only been in the lead for about three of those six minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, is, that is a good point, to be fair. That is a very good point. I think our broth, it was about half a pass. Yeah. Um, uh, Blair, I nearly forgot. I know there's a very important point that you're you're deeply impassioned about that you want to wanted to bring up during the the course of this discussion. Uh, so Josh Edwards and his his uh, choice of hosiery is that the right word? Yes. <laughs> Honestly, right. So I'm going to try and keep this really limited, but it really bugs me. There's two things that bug me about footballers and socks. This sounds so petty, but socks and footballers. Only so, two. I, just the two, one on each foot. And it's so Muffet comes on and he's doing that stupid roll the socks down with the tiny little shin guards in them. Look at me, I'm different thing, right? And it bugs me. It's a team sport for a reason. Stop trying to look different. You're a tube. But the one that really gets me is Josh Edwards, right? Now, I'm sorry, that boy's in good shape, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to sit here and, and slag off that guy's physique. But his calves are not so big that he has to tear a hole in the back of his socks for circulatory reasons. It is utter nonsense. And the sooner they bin it from football, the better. Like, They're no Ross Millen calves, are they? Do you know what? They're not. See, if a Rovers player did it, I'd begin them pelters to I hate it. I'm like, it's not, if nothing else, it's disrespectful to the kit, man. Like Bruce Banner, if just his lower legs get really angry. <laughs> <laughs> it's oh, like, so honestly. Just, just perfectly burst through the back of his socks. It's a, a, a real... Um, like if the Hulk had cramp. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there, there's been a few over the years. I think it was at Sadio Mane used to do it quite a lot when he played at Liverpool and stuff. He used to get the ones that had like four or five little holes in the back of their socks. But Josh Edwards just decided to join them all together. Like... <laughs> What it did you get for Christmas? A new pair socks of every game. Yeah. New socks every game. Yes. Well, no, no, Carol, they'd, they'd be a nightmare to put on if you tried to put them on again because your foot would go through the back of the. <laughs> it would, but uh, obviously, yeah, the Rovers players, like, Rovers players don't need to cut holes in their socks because they've got uh, hashtag grip socks, grip which socks, are uh, presumably ergonomically. Actually... They've also yeah, got right, derby ones. Right, I mean, right, maybe right, if you spend right, less time. Cutting holes in your socks should win a derby game. Aye, and I not reenacting so. gladiators in training that have more than four available players. <laughs> um, uh, right, sorry. Let's just do a quick round of uh, a man of the match, and then we'll uh, we'll move on. Uh, sadly, move on from this one. Um, Carol, kick us off, please. Matt O'Reilly, I think he different. Obviously, two goals did fantastic. Was really strong at the back. Yep. I Matt O'Reilly for I a second there. I was, like, no. I was like, our signings <laughs> have came in very, very uh, interesting there. Inexplicably Danish, Matt O'Reilly. But um, yeah, good shout for Dan O'Reilly. Um, I'm I, actually I'm going to join you with, with Dan O'Reilly. I think Josh Mullen did a very, very good case that I suspect at least a couple of you are going to make. But I thought um, there was a, an added onus on the defence in that game given the, the issue with the goalkeeper and I thought Dan O'Reilly was, was excellent throughout um, in addition to his two goals um, Robbie you next please uh, Josh Mullen albeit were given the uh, award for uh, heroics to big Kev Dabrowski uh, just for battling on just putting his body on the line and just saying nah I just fancy getting another one against that mob along the road just new year same derby Good man. Uh, Scott, you next, please. I, I mean, it's hard to argue with getting it to O'Reilly, to be fair. He scored the two goals to win the game. So, I, I, just in general, I thought he had a solid game anyway. Defensively, he was clearing everything and winning these challenges. So, I thought he had an overall good game. Uh, I actually was wanting to say that, I, I said it earlier, that I thought it was Scott Brown's best game for a long time. I actually could have even said that had O'Reilly not scored the two goals and it was some like split between two different players, you know, Scott Brown probably could have got it because uh, I thought he was just dominant for the whole whatever seventy five minutes that he before he came off. 
and he clearly was struggling the fact that he came off because he's somebody that usually he'll kind of he'll go and get one of these jail things and just battle on. But it clearly was something that either they didn't want to risk getting worse or he just couldn't get through that. So fair play him, but uh, no, I, I thought he was also very good. I bet genuinely, I think you Murray said he was he was cramping in his calves, so maybe his socks were too tight. <laughs> um, right, Blair, you're man of the match, please. Uh, yeah, to be fair, it's hard to disagree with anything anybody said. There was a lot of them deserved a lot of credit, but for me, Josh Mullen, like as good as Dan O'Reilly, or as well as he did, and as good as his goals were, you you didn't score them without the deliveries that he had into that that box. They were absolutely of another level. Fantastic. And uh, last but not least, Christina, your man of the match, please. Um, yeah, I'm going with Scott Brown. Like Scott, actually, I was thinking that. But, I mean, you can make an argument with anybody. Um, just for Blair, the only person I think that can wish off like that, by the way, is Adam Traore. He's the only one I'm going to have to pull that off. Um, also, yeah, just as a little credit for Dylan Easton, that he did it on Saturday, and I'm sure he did it again on Tuesday. See when the ball comes to him, and he comes down the, the wing, and he's right at the corner spot, and the ball comes to him from height, and he just goes like that, boom, and stops. That's just beautiful. I love that. I want him to do that every game. I love watching. Pretty sure he'll even when try. The same oh. bit when it bounces off his head. Oh. oh. He's just brilliant. Brilliant. Um, but yeah, no, Scott Brown, man of the match for me. To be fair, we must be well over the hour mark on this game, and we've that's the first time we've mentioned Dylan Easton, barely mentioned Lewis Vaughan, yeah. barely mentioned Jack Hamilton. But full credit to all these guys, um, a really, really strong. Lewis uh, Vaughan put in a good shift actually yeah. at the game. That's it. They did have um, sort of like small parts, like uh, Louis Vaughan absolutely humiliating Joe Chalmers with the nutmeg to win the free kick at the first goal, for instance. Yep. Um, I know. Actually, sometimes feel bad about. Lewis Vaughan because see for me Lewis Vaughan is just the best will always be the best and I feel like because we sometimes just think that it's never really spoken about he's, uh, he's still he's just, top scorer he's in the league as well he's still top scorer in the league Aye, like, it's just because he's so good you just don't even you just forget him now we're just used to it Aye. that's how you do you kind of take him take him for granted sometimes yeah because um, yeah, he, was, he was excellent throughout let's um, not say that he's still got a new contract to sign come on Lee. <laughs> Um, yeah, definitely. He's not the only one in that um, in that category. Hopefully, we'll get a wee bit of movement on that front uh, or those fronts um, fairly soon. Now, uh, just before we move on from this, one, there was obviously a really horrible incident after this game. Um, it's obviously been the paper, it's been the telly and stuff as well. And we're certainly not going to not going to dwell on it. I don't think there's much that we're going to add to whatever conversation that might be. But Robbie, I do know that you spoke to Kieran sort of briefly. Um so I don't know if you just want to say just a, a kind of quick word on that. Yeah, just really, really quick word on that. Um I dropped Kieran a quick message just to obviously say that we're we're all rooting for him. It was a, a really horrific incident, really low life behaviour uh, from a group of fans uh, that you've seen there. Rovers fans uh, the out of any fan base in Scotland they can tell you that the the a small number of people with poor decision making does not mean that a full club is full of scumbags. Uh, our fan base will tell you that before anyone else, given what happened a couple of years ago in that January transfer window. Exactly the same with Dunfermline. The majority of Dunfermline fans you can quite easily get along with, go for a pint with and have a laugh about the situation. Um, I, well, maybe. Um, but yeah, that was just really sad to see. I hope that for Kieran, that you're back at games when it's comfortable for you, just take your time. Um, and again, I know that the club have obviously reached out and offered for you to go along to sort of watch training and get the team bust at the Airdrie game and just do what's right for you because I get that it's a horrendous experience that no one should go through regardless of your background, whether you're a young kid, whether you're a 70-year-old man or woman. It's it's unacceptable behaviour and hopefully, uh, with the matter being with the police, that we'll see the full extent of the law applied to it and that's all we really need to say as a podcast, I think, on it. Yeah, 100%. I think we all um, echo those uh, those sentiments. So, um, I'm going to I'm gonna kind of cheat slightly here uh, in the interest of time. I'm going to bring two kind of segments together. So, um, by way of looking forward to the Airdrie game on Saturday... I'm going to use my big question uh, this evening to ask each of you to give me your starting 11 for that one, please. Any changes that you would make um, going into this one? 
uh, particularly bearing in mind that this was the uh, the scene of our last defeat. Um, let's see. Let's uh, let's leave Christina for last because I'm sure she's got some wild uh, choices in there somewhere, including Kevin Dubrovsky up front. So <laughs> let's start with uh, Scott. Come to you first of all, please. I um I've no really went with too many changes to be fair. I think I've got it might actually just be the one. Uh, I've kept. I I want us to keep the same shape just because I think that we saw that it just gave us a lot more control in the ball, especially in the first half. And if we can get that, because they are a decent football inside, never just a not a decent side that they can also play. So we need to stop them for playing also after uh, putting our own sort of stamp on things. So I, I would still go with Brown and Burn in the middle. But uh, So I would keep with, if Kev's fit, go again with, with Kev and go. And then same back four, because um, as far as I'm aware, this is technically O'Reilly's last game yep. on his contract. So um, And then hopefully we get better news about him uh, next week. But... Uh, and then the two, as I said, Brown Bun, and then I would go again with Mullen out on the right, Vaughn at 10, and then Easton out on the left. My one change is up front. I thought that Jack Hamilton was just starting to jump for jumping sake at, <laughs> at points in that game, and I thought he, he was actually a little bit anonymous at times, uh, which was a bit unusual because he's been very good, especially in the Derby games at Easton Park. Uh, in terms of getting the ball, making sure that uh, he's heavily involved. But I thought it was one of his poorer games, I thought. But I would actually bring Callum Smith for this one and put him up front because I think, from what I've seen of Virgie, they're not, they're not the most mobile at centre-half. And I would actually rather that we got them turned kind of over the shoulder with Callum Smith's pace. And then also, when you've got all the technical players like Easton, uh, Vaughan and Mullen that are around there as well. I think you could start getting sort of like one, two going in. Um, yeah, I just think that it would be better to get their defence turned and uh, I would go with more pace in the team. Yeah, it's interesting, especially given the way that last game went. I thought Jack Hamilton had a very uh, rootless afternoon the last time we were there. Um, he worked his socks off, but he got no change out of their defence at all. Um, so that's certainly an interesting uh, way of, of kind of squaring that circle. Uh, Carol, what about you? What are you thinking for this one? Pretty much with Scott. My my thing is, I, I, it's we've got such a, a wealth of choices. It's like, who do you leave out? Do you leave it Connolly? Is Matthews going to come back? Is Brown still going to be cramping? Yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, I would love to see Matthews start, but where do you start him? Who do you, who do you leave out? So I think I'm going to go with Scott. I think Hamilton for Smith. That's my only change from, from Saturday, but I would love to see Matthews start, but it's where do you put him? Where do you put him? Who do you, who do you leave out to put on or who, who do you say you're going to come on and be a finisher rather than a substitute? But yeah, that's my issue. Is who do you, who do you take out to put Matthews on? So yeah, Matthews on the bench and swapping out Halpinson for Smith. All right, um, Robbie Ross Matthews sneaking into your eleven. Uh, no, I've got all the consistency of I don't know a Foo Fighters discog discography when we're talking about like just picking lineups. For me, every time it's a four-two-three-one. Um, big Kevin goals, Liam Dick, Ross Mullen, or Josh. Uh, yeah, Ross Mullen. Um, centre backs Murray and uh, O'Reilly, Burn and Brown, whole midfielders, Easton, Vaughan. Uh, I'd maybe put in um, Mullen over just the way that that game finished, and then Jack Hamilton up top because I'm a big, boring individual. Shall we say? <laughs> All right, um, well, I think I'm going to come in and give you mine as well because mine is very similar to, to what you guys have said. But I'm I'm maybe making a a slightly bolder decision on on one of these. So I'm the same same goalkeeper, same back four, same holding two in midfield, Brown and Burn. I'm making two changes ahead of them. So I actually would play Dan Connolly over Josh Mullen on this one. 
going back to the last game at Airdrie, they were very happy for us to kind of uh, to sort of stand off us, and it was almost a case of trying to bring the game to them. And I think we struggled to do that. And I think Aidan Connolly's a little bit more direct, a little bit more running with the ball. I think they are happier defending against a Josh Mullen, where it's a case of swing crosses in and we'll deal with them. Um, so that's what I'd do on one side. And on the other side, I would play Callum Smith over Dylan Easton. That's really my big call. Just, I think, Dylan Easton, more than anything else, he's played a lot of football recently, possibly more than anybody else in that kind of attacking unit. Um, and I think Callum Smith has done enough to kind of deserve a start. It feels like he's been on the kind of sore end of the somebody has to sit out all the time um, recently. So I would have Connolly on the right, Smith on the left, but with all these guys um, obviously coming off the bench. And I would keep Jack Hamilton up, up top. But I, I really, I see your point, Scott, um, with what you're saying with that. I can definitely see where you're coming from. Uh, Blair, what about you? Actually, somewhere in between. <clears throat> um, you, you've kind of stolen my thunder a wee bit, Duncan, but I agree with you. I would take Dylan Easton out. Um, but I would I would play Smith over Hamilton. I think Hamilton's not had the best two or three games, if I'm being honest. Um, and I think Dylan Easton's played a lot of football and, again, hasn't, since Dundee United hasn't been at his best, he's been kind of carrying that wee back thing and, and I don't think he's firing 100%. Um, so I would actually play Connolly um, on the right and I'd play Mullen on the left. Um, okay. And then Smith up front for Hamilton. Um, for the same reason as, as Scott said, I think, and, and actually kind of getting back to what you're saying, I think they'll deal with those balls into the box better than they will somebody turning them and, and getting them behind them. Um, but I also think if things aren't going well, the one thing we needed on a, what was it, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Tuesday night, the one thing we needed in the last 20 minutes was Jack Hamilton coming off the bench. It was actually a bit like at Tannadice where we were kind of getting pressed a little bit and you just needed that option. And Jamie Gullen's know that option. Like, and it's, do you know what I mean? So having Hamilton for the last, even the last 25 minutes or something, if we need to, to kind of change things up a bit or protect a one goal lead as we so often do um, I think he's a good option for that and um, Christina you're starting 11 please I hope you've got your pen and paper ready because uh, Blair's request was that I did this in alphabetical order today so you're going to have to figure it out on your own <laughs> Brown, Byrne Dabrowski Easton, Hamilton Millen, Mullen Murray, O'Reilly, Smith, and Vaughan. That's all right. Broski at wing back sounds good. <laughs> so you really um, don't like Liam Dick, do you? No, now, you know I knew somebody was <laughs> going to say this, right? And he's always the first one I change, and I don't know why I do it. I feel really bad, actually. I I just realised that as I was speaking, and I'm like, I feel really bad that I've done that again. But. I was actually I can't thinking can't break with this podcast, can he, Dicko? It's like you've either got Graham Meldrum stalking you or you've got uh, <laughs> Christina I need to you. strike a happy medium somewhere with him. I think uh, you're a consistent performer in my um, hypothetical starting 11 slam. So there's always that. But I'm not going to be stalking you. So it's okay. <laughs> I was um, thinking more keeping Ham a lot, Hamilton on, but actually doing like a Vaughn Smith just behind him was my thoughts. Um, purely just based on the fact that we lost at Airdrie and I was thinking we'll go for like a more attacking view on it. A 3-6-1, isn't it? Pretty much, yeah. The manager's favourite. Um, I think that this genuinely is, is a really... I think, to be honest, I think I say this every time we preview a game. I, I always say, I think it's going to be a really interesting game. But I do. <laughs> um, just because of the way that Airdrie played in the last game... Um, the last away game. I thought their game plan worked perfectly, but in a way that's quite difficult to replicate. So they very much sat back, asked us to come out and play, and we kind of didn't for a lot of it. So I said right at the start, that was the game where um, Sean Byrne and Scott Brown kind of played together in the holding defence the last time. But Scott Brown was quite reserved, so we didn't really come out to meet them it was quite a quite a standoffish game and there was only really one point in the second half where they actually managed to kind of sucker us in a little bit 
and they sprung their trap perfectly and they got the goal and they beat us one nothing. But it's as I say, it's quite difficult to do that a second time. You know, Ian Murray's not daft. He's he's very um along with his, his staff, they're very well prepared, they're very well drilled for these kind of things. So it'll be interesting to see if um what Reese McCabe does differently. Because again, they've had some some decent results recently. Um to Airdrie, a very a very interesting side. And I think we've said previously that we've all been quite impressed with Airdrie this season. Um so it'll be uh, yeah, certainly a good one. Um so again, let's very quickly let's just do a quick um a quick score prediction for this one as well, please. And uh, Carol, start with you again. Uh, I'm gonna be pessimistic two two. All right, okay. A very, a very rare thing for this podcast where someone doesn't predict the rovers to win a game. Um, which um, again, yeah. as yeah. I've said, has been a pretty good strategy for uh, for this season. Um all right, uh, Scott, you next, please. I'm going to say that it's going to be similar, but uh, I think we'll nick it in true style this season. Of uh, I think we'll win late on 3 2, whether it's a penalty or whatever. I think uh, we'll nick it just at the end. All right, excellent. Um, Blair, your prediction, please. Um, I mean, our away form is brilliant at the moment. So. I do kind of fancy us, but I think it will be. I don't know what it is. In my head, I think 1 0, but they score. So I'll say 2 1. 2 1. All right. Uh, Christina? Um, I'm not confident for the first time. I'm going at 1 0, Airdrie. Whoa. I think Sorry. genuinely, I think that might be the first time anyone on this podcast has ever predicted we might get beat. I'm <laughs> sorry. I just think that I think either. that's. I think this is the game. I think this is going to be one. Because um, yeah, you're not going. I'm not going. I know. I was pleading to you at the pub <laughs> after. You better be going. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going. Um, so, yeah, I just think... I don't know. I just think my gut's telling me that... My gut on Tuesday was very confident. And then since then, my gut now has changed to... I just think it's... The time is up. Are you going, Scott? All right. Because your away form was decent, your home form is shocking. <laughs> the defensive record isn't great at home. <laughs> a wise scout account for fans. <laughs> yeah, goals against. But my um, HG isn't good at home. <laughs> <laughs> Robbie, your uh, your scoreline prediction, please. Um, I'm going to go two 0 Rovers, and I think that we've um, right. I think we've got the bottle to do it. Our first two goal win. Woof. Aye. Well, I have to tell you, you're I, still uh, crossing your fingers for your Christmas present, aren't you? Aye. Uh, uh, well, it's I've moved on to birthday now, so <laughs> right. This is this is a real kind of uh, Freaky Friday role reversal because normally I'm the I'm the pessimist. I totally changed my mind on this one. I think this would be three 0 Rovers. I think this is the week. This is the time. Um, Airdrie, the the. Boy playing right back, um, I think is it Kanayo Megwa? They've had from Hibs. Apparently, Hibs are taking them on holiday. They're taking them to Dubai for a They're couple doing of weeks. A Dario. Doing a Dario and uh, taking them away. I think that's going to be enough of a disruption in their defence. He looked really and, good uh, in the last game at Starks. Yeah, he was excellent. Um, he played against us for Hibs as well in the, the League Cup and he looked quite ropey, but um, he's, he's been excellent by all accounts for Airdrie. And and, just for uh, clarity, that was, a, that was a Zanata, not a Valenti reference there. <laughs> uh, correct, yes. Well, I mean, Dario goes roaming quite a lot, shall <laughs> yeah. we say? So, aye, right in that area of the park as I was a right back. Aye, aye. Um, yeah, so no, I'm 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 fully um, I'm all in on this one. I think this is going to be a, a glorious triumph. This is going to be the one that takes us to the uh promised land of a victory by more than a single goal. And I'm uh, happy to take the blame with the uh, inevitable jinx that I have just caused. Can I just ask, uh, Duncan, yes. what's in your mug? What is in my mug? Yeah. Uh, it's, it should just be water. You know, that's a damn fine mug that you've got there. Where did you get it? <laughs> it's funny you should ask. Um, some of you might have seen uh, might have seen some of these mugs previously. Uh, so there was, if you're on the, the Twitter or the Instagram, which Carol's been looking after... Uh, we have taken our first steps into the uh, the wonderful world of merchandising. 
Uh, so, Blair, this has very much been your uh, your baby over the last couple of weeks. Um, why don't you give us a quick rundown on kind of the, the first of all, the motivation behind it and uh, and what people might expect to see and, and indeed where they can see it. Yeah, so I'll try and keep this as short as I can. I was, and I said this to you all the time as well, and, and I very much said it when we put that kind of statement together, really nervous about this because... Like, I feel like we're just a bunch of jobbers who are talking about our football team. Do you know what I mean? We absolutely are. Just We're all <laughs> nodding, but I'm yeah. just going to vocalise this. We have <laughs> no idea if, like, if you're a player involved with this and happen to listen. Like, genuinely not got a clue what's going on. No, I <laughs> as, if, as if that wasn't immediately apparent <laughs> at any point over the last hour and a half. But in terms of sign-ins, you know what I mean? The fact that we managed to get Leslie on board with his Microsoft Paint <laughs> images um so yeah it's, it was just one of those things like we we've kind of got to the stage where we're what now 20 this is the 28th episode and the feedback's been great which and it's actually been really humble and i have to say the feedback that we've had across the board people and coming up to us and at games and stuff and, and talking about it i even had somebody um recognize just my voice at the dundee united game when i was talking to my mates it's just surreal totally bizarre but um i feel like we've kind of got to the stage where We've got a podcast that works, right? And and people seem to be enjoying it. Um, and we're doing it on Zoom. And I, I know Duncan definitely feels the same as me. I have a bit of a bugbear that when we kind of talk over each other, which we invariably do, Zoom kind of cuts us out. So we started looking at different software and all the rest of it. And and effectively, it's going to cost money. Podcasting isn't free. Um, we've been kind of dipping into our own pockets and stuff to pay um, and some more than others, I have to say, have been paying quite a bit, actually, to to kind of get this off the ground and get it running. But I feel like as a concept, it's kind of proven itself. So um, I thought, you know what, we can ask for, I mean, we talked, like, we never even talked about it, to be fair. We all said straight off the bat, we're not doing subscription. Like, we're just not, not going there. Um, we could ask for donations. We could ask for sponsorship. We could, or what about if we just stuck some of Leslie's graphics on some mugs and some t-shirts and said, do you fancy buying them? So we kind of, that was the premise. That was completely it. So we need roughly about 150 quid a year to to get the, this kind of thing running itself. And I thought, all we need to do is sell a few. So I did a bit of research, did a bit of looking online and stuff, and this dropship model. So we don't see any of the products. We don't handle it. We don't do the shipping. We don't do anything. It's worldwide. They've got distribution centers all over the place. Effectively, we've stuck Leslie's images on some mugs and on some t-shirts. If you decide to buy them, they ship them straight to you. Um, and all that happens is we basically make a little bit of money off of every sale that we make. Now, I watch the Apprentice, right? So I'm going to just dig myself out here for a little bit. I watch it every year. I love The Apprentice. It's utter nonsense. But there's always that bit where it's one of those buying and selling tasks. And you're like, oh, my God, are you stupid? How are you going to sell it at that price and make any money? So <laughs> in comes the panic on the opening night, straight after the Pars game, because we'd done the mug and we'd given it to Big Kev. And he'd very gratefully taken a, a photograph with it and stuff. So the Kev Bucks um, logo that that uh, Leslie did after the the making the coffee, there's Christina on the on the YouTube with it, um, a signed version. They're not all signed. They're not all signed. Just going <laughs> to add that Kev it for Kev. <laughs> That's a special. One. But um, so yeah, we, we <laughs> we're selling this stuff, and I'm kind of watching the orders coming in, and I'm going, bloody hell, this is really good. We've got like eight or nine orders, and I started to so the. The technical side's really boring, but it's two different accounts. One where the money goes out, one where the money comes in. So I'm kind of watching the two of them. And we've turned over about 200, 250 quids worth of stuff, like in the first hour and a half. And I'm looking at it and we'd made two pound profit. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God. And then somebody bought something, literally at that moment. And I've obviously set up the profit bit wrong because at that moment I then recalculated it and we were about a pound fifty down. I basically paid for folk to have mugs. <laughs> so panic sets in. I had to up the prices. So, so congratulations to the first 10 customers who got it at, at bargain prices. Um, we've upped it a little bit. Um, but yeah, so it's generating a little bit of money um, and it'll effectively cover the, the cost of the podcast going forward. Um, but it is a bit of fun, hopefully. Hopefully people will get behind it. Um, we've got I've got um we've got drinks bottles, we've got mugs, we've got cups, we've got 
t-shirts it's a lot of nonsense but it's a bit of fun um, and it's your chance to have our favourite actually and I have to say this was Duncan's original design so the the Falkirk tears and, oh, and Orphan as well I know but you got mug though oh I, I stuck it on a mug yeah. but to be fair you I don't think I can take much credit for that that's where the idea came in that's where the magic happened um, so yeah it's it's up if, if you guys are interested in it go on to the socials um, I will say, and, and this is shameless, but if you follow the link that's on the social media to the shop, we get money off of the fees, so we don't pay as much for selling it, effectively. So rather than just going through and searching for it, if you can go through the, the social media and click on it, um, they, they actually waive like 4% or something off. I mean, it's ridiculous, the fees anyway, but they waive some of it off, so um, if you can do that, that'd be great, but Absolutely blown away by the number of folk that have ordered stuff. Yeah, um, and also as well, did you not mention about the returns as well? I think. Uh, oh yeah. So again, it's a bit of fun, but we kind of need just to bear with us in the sense that we don't have any of this stuff in stock. So please be very careful when you're ordering. Um, the t-shirts I would say run a little bit on the small side. Um, I have put up a graphic on the the shop that shows you the chest size. It's pit to pit, so you just double it and it makes it your chest measurement kind of thing. Um, but we can't really do returns. If we do returns, we are paying for the return, basically. Unless it's faulty, obviously. If it's faulty, you let us know um, and we can return that to the, the printing company. Um, but yeah, for wrong sizes and stuff, like it's, it's going to cost us money. So I'm just crossing my fingers that people are sensible with it. If you, you get to buy a t-shirt and it's too small, give it to a smaller pal. <laughs> <laughs> That's the official policy of the oh no 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 podcast. Or sell it to them. We don't care. <laughs> Put on your wall. It's a nice piece of art. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so you will find the link to that. Um, I think probably the easiest one is to find it on the Twitter, which is at O-N-N-N podcast. Uh, we'll maybe see Robbie if you can pin the put with a link in it. It's probably the, the easiest way to go. Um, um, but yeah, I think I think today is a hundred days, Robbie, since you sent a, a speculative group message to kind of a, a group of fellow Rovers fans uh, asking if anybody wanted to start a podcast. And I think, I mean, at this point, I think we know about five percent more about doing podcasts than we did then. But as Blair says, it has been really humbling, really kind of staggering the, the response that people seem to be interested in listening to this inane kind of rambling that we do. So the the main thing from all of us is just to say thank you very much for uh, for listening. I still think it's weird if you're watching, but I'm, I'm slowly coming around to it. So, uh, so thank you to you guys too. Um, we will be back over the weekend, uh, obviously after the Airdrie game. As always, if you're at the game and people are like, what's a podcast, who are these weirdos, this is who we are, send them our way, tell them to listen to us, and um, as you see, we will be back on, I would guess, Sunday, with a, a debrief of the Rovers' comprehensive 3-0 win over Airdrie audience. <laughs>